Sam Foreman. I'm an historian uh, and a physician, and uh, I, as you probably noticed, uh, do not have an appropriate Boston accent. Uh, I grew up in Philadelphia and uh, moved here about 20 years ago and I think the area is so delightful. I'm here for the duration. Uh, I was just uh, speaking to a new member, speculating on how many generations you have to live here to claim to be a Bostonian. Uh, it's got to be more than 20 years, so at any rate, uh, I don't pack the car yet. I park the car and thereby show where I came from. But at any rate, I, I uh, was introduced when I was an undergraduate more years ago than I would want to admit uh, to Joseph Warren, a uh, Bostonian, a North End person whose uh, resume, as I studied history and the history of science, was just beyond belief uh, that this fellow was a very significant actor uh, just prior to the American Revolution and uh, shaped America as a founding figure uh, in a lot of ways. And uh, it, it intrigued me uh, not only all the things that he, he s was said to have done, uh, but also uh, the age in which he had done them. By the time he was 34, he was the head of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, in essence, the governor of Massachusetts. He was the head of the, uh, com its Committee of Safety, who had purview over the Minutemen of Massachusetts. He was a chief mason in North America. He was also the leading doctor in Boston. So it, I actually found that hard to believe. So I, I set that aside uh, in my career. Uh, subsequently, in the, in the military and business, until I had time to to pick up this thread about seven years ago, as to just who was this fellow, Joseph Warren, and and uh, as I moved to Boston, I, I it really puzzled me of just how obscure this fellow has become. Now, do, uh, do people here know uh, where the commemoration to Joseph Warren in the North End is? No, because there isn't any. <laughs> None. Nada. There isn't any in downtown Boston along the Freedom Track. There is a barn building at the Mass General. There is, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make the linkage at the end of this talk. It's not this Warren. Uh, it is related. Yes, that's very good. Uh, so there's scant notice. In fact, there is a, there is a statue to Warren uh, at the Bunker Hill Monument in Charleston. And they're very proud of that over in Charleston, over this brief military aspect of his career. He was actually a fighting ma major general for all of three days. And uh, however, if you walk around Charleston, which I have, and ask the people there who is Joseph Warren and what did he do, the uh, vast majority have no idea. So I uh, revisited this. And I found that one of many reasons why he's not too well known is he's an extremely difficult person to learn about. Unlike a number of the founding figures who have volumes and volumes of their collected papers, like John Adams and um, George Washington and Thomas Jefferson, and figures that you'll see that this guy fits into. Um, Warren had very few of his papers survive. First of all, he didn't live as long as those folks. Uh, but also, uh, his personal papers were said to have been destroyed by accident in a fire in the 1830s of a descendant's house. And the most, most voluminous records in his hand are records of his medical practice, which are in abbreviations of, uh, in Latin, abbreviations for a kind of medical practice that's so obscure that nobody could make heads or tails out of it. And uh, so these, um, these account books uh, have existed at the Mass Historical Society for 100 years. And they're, they're treated as relics, you know, interesting things that are found in father touched, you know, but not much else. But what I found was that it was actually an entree to a forgotten life, that these account books mapped out his uh, personal and professional relationships 
And I was able to use those hints in order to go laterally into surviving letters and diaries and reconstruct his life and back into it. And uh, I will share with you an overview of what I found and uh, <coughs> see if um, you agree with me that th this fellow was an incredible North Angle. So um, uh, there's a, there is a picture of his account book in or one of them in the center. And I actually, uh, in the course of writing the book, uh, ended up transcribing the account book into a ma modern database management uh, system where I could slice and dice it every which way. And the picture on the right is uh, Joe Bourne's friend, John Hancock, uh, brandishing his account book, which was sort of a sign of his, uh, his uh, position in the world as a merchant prince to keep track of all the shipments going in and out of the wharves in Boston, including North End. The account books themselves look like this. They are quite arcane. You'll see a blotch on the right. This book actually sat in Joseph Warren's medical practice in his home for 12, 13 years from when he started his practice all the way to the April the 18th, 1775, which you may know is the day before the start of the Revolutionary War. That's not a random association, as you see. Um, so this, uh, this was sitting there while he was treating patients, you know, 100 years before bacteria were known, at least 150 prior to antibiotics. So I, uh, there are rules of the uh, archives, you know, when, when handling documents like this that are so fragile and, and uh, unique and priceless that you wear white gloves in your hands to protect the documents. And, and I was more than happy to do that as I spent time with, with uh, these documents and others. But as a physician, knowing where this book had been, I found myself washing my hands after I would use it. <laughs> even though it sort of makes no sense, but, you know, just in case. There's some very uh, fancy reconstruction of some of the missing account books. Starians get excited about this, nobody else does, so I'll just skip that one. Uh, okay, so what about the life of Joseph Warren? How did he get himself into the North End? He actually started out as a, a multi-generation Warren family, a rural yeoman family, as they were called, you know, reasonably well-off farmers, in Roxburgh, where the first Warren uh, set up shop there in the late 17th century. Generations of Warren men and women adapted a strain of apples from England to be the first practical strain of apples in America, the Warren russet apples. Now, russets mean a bumpy kind of appearance. Uh, that uh, are pretty unlike modern, what we would look at as modern apples. Um, and uh, you actually see these things in farmers markets, including the North End here, very briefly in the fall under the misnomer Roxbury russets. But in fact they're Warren russets and they were developed by the Warren family. Not by Joseph Warren himself, but his father and his grandfather. What's unique about these apples, before I leave them, since there's some people interested in envir environmental issues, is that these bumpy kind of apples have a very high sugar content, higher than modern apples. You can make a hard cider out of these apples, 9% alcohol, easily. They also ripen late in the fall and would stay over the winter without refrigeration. Very good for shipping apples as trade goods to the Caribbean, uh, just keeping them over the winter, uh, making cider out of them. In fact, they, they just did just about everything with apples except eat them like we do. <laughs> so at any rate, uh, the uh, apple trees, uh, besides just some environmental uh, sidelight, figure into the story. Because as Joseph's father, and Joseph was the eldest of four sons who stretched uh, from 12 years, he was 12 years older than his youngest brother, John, the two brothers in between. Uh, so as his father was out uh, taking in the apple harvest late in October of 17, 
1955. The frost must have been out on the trees. His father slipped, fell out of the apple tree, and broke his neck. Not only that, he was alive for a little while, and the first person on the scene is Joseph's youngest brother, who wasn't two years old. For the rest of his life, he, uh, Brother John found that as a haunting thought. Uh, Joseph himself was 14 and had just stu started Harvard College, where he uh, could have been sort of recalled as the de facto head of the family in this sort of patriarchal uh, times. But in fact, his mother, Mary Stevens Warren, was a pretty forceful lady uh, within the confines of being a lady uh, in uh, Roxbury and Boston. Uh, so was able to actually keep the farm going at one part, even mortgaged part of it, so that Joseph could stay in Harvard and complete college. So they were very well thought of in the neighborhood. So he was kind of an orphan while he was starting in college. So his early career, even before he went off to Harvard, he was, uh, uh, the farm was diversified. In addition to apples, they had uh, cows, they, they uh, grew some grains. Um, he would uh, hawk the milk from the farm in the Boston market, including the North End. So he wasn't really of a gentleman family, and later on in life, some of his political opponents, loyalists and Tories, would make fun of him as a bare-legged milk boy mm. hawking the family's milk in Boston, mm. including the North End. But in fact, he and his colleagues were very proud of it as people who worked with their hands, and made a living, honestly, uh, and worked hard for it. Uh, he graduated Harvard uh, in four years. Um, he uh, uh, decided, while he was in college, to become a physician. And uh, in all of New England and Massachusetts at the time, there were only three ways to become a physician. The first way was you could convince your daddy and mommy to send you to Europe to a prestigious medical school, usually in London. Uh, other uh, preferred places were in Scotland, if you were decent with languages on the continent, uh, including France. So you would go over there, get the best recognized medical knowledge uh, at the time available, you might also advance some of the business interests of your family, since it tended to be rich trading families where the only people who could afford that sort of thing. And you'd come back and you'd set up your practice. That was not an alternative for Joseph Warren and most others of his class. Uh, so if he wanted to become a doctor, you would be apprenticed to a doctor like that. And the most prestigious doctor in Boston at the time was the loyalist Dr. James Lloyd. So Joseph uh, apprenticed himself with a two-year medical apprentice ship to Dr. Lloyd from 1761 to 63, joined the St. Andrew's Lodge of Masons around there, where he met what came to be a lifelong friend, Paul Revere. Uh, he, began, he began his private medical practice in 1763 on Hanover Street in the North End. During, uh, uh, within a year of starting practice, he volunteered during a smallpox epidemic for a smallpox inoculation hospital, where one third of the population of Boston was inoculated. Little side story, little medical story, smallpox was the dreaded plague of the 18th century. There were several outbreaks during the 18th century. But the medical community, in cooperation with the town of Boston, surrounding towns, did something innovative called inoculation. Now this is not to be confused with smallpox immunization, which some of you from some science course may have heard of Edward Jenner and smallpox and cowpox and that kind of thing. No, this is, in, this is being inoculated with live smallpox taken from a stricken person and deliberately inoculated into a person who's never had it before. The thought was, if you had this controlled kind of smallpox, it would be not as fatal as catching it in the wild. And indeed, that was true. They kept statistics. You were 20 times more likely to survive a controlled case of 
smallpox, deliberately inoculated than if you caught it wild. So although the mortality rate was about, oh, this is about the inoculation, it was about a half to 1%. That was considered a godsend compared to 20 times worse. And in the inoculation hospital, which included people being isolated at the time they were had this deliberately inoculated smallpox, Joseph was the house doctor. He was the doctor inside the hospital with all these uh, isolated, severely ill, deliberately inoculated people. Everybody survived in Joseph Warren's hospital, which brought him renowned as a doctor and as a healer uh, very early in his life. He was in his 20s. Did a year of his, uh, starting his private practice, and he also ran into people from all over the society, not just from this small private practice he was starting, but he was treated the, the governor's children, who are, of course, very worried as their children are in the smallpox hospital and you have no communication with them or know if they survived until the end, uh, uh, to uh, common people that were uh, given the inoculations gratis. Um, he, uh, this uh, malpractice situation with Dr. Young, uh, he showed his wit and uh, acid wit and humor in that this small, uh, this uh, malpractice dispute was actually carried out in the newspapers as an op-ed piece as opposed to the courtroom because there was no such thing as malpractice cases in the courts at the time. Uh, some of his patients, um, very interesting people in their own right. Some of them are more famous than he just now. Uh, Joseph Warren was uh, a physician to the Wheatley family. There was a preternaturally talented slave servant in the Wheatley household, Phyllis Wheatley, later known as the patriot poetess of the revolution. She met Joseph Warren when she was about 10, and they apparently had some uh, deep impressions on each other. Uh, interestingly, Joseph Warren's medical practice was blind to race. Joseph Warren, and you can, you can tell this from the account books, no one actually talked about it at the time. I don't even know if it was well known, except to the patients who actually saw him in his practice. But Joseph Warren saw patients in the order that they <coughs> presented with their health problems treated them according to their clinical need with the same treatments and charges for all. That included John Hancock, the richest person in New England at the time, also a St. Andrews Lodge Mason and a personal friend of this one. It also included people like Data Boses, a, a slave who is otherwise unknown except for his notation in Joseph Warren's account. There was no back of a bus in Joseph Warren's practice. Joseph Warren uh, became politically uh, active as a sort of behind the scenes son of liberty after the 1765 Stamp Act. He started to write op-ed pieces under pseudonyms. He became the protege of Samuel Adams, who was considered a pretty radical son of liberty. And uh, disagreements were over residual taxation after the Stamp Act, where Great Britain insisted on taxing the colonies without representative government in those taxes, or in the, in the passing of those taxes. That was a, a, a running flashpoint within North America asserting its liberties within the British Empire. Um, protests against uh, tax collectors and that sort of thing culminated in the, the first occupation of Boston in October of 1768. And this is a Paul Revere uh, engraving that you might have you know, run into in some of the history books of the uh, British Army landing on Long Wharf and uh, those little red dots there are marching into the town to occupy Boston, which is perceived of by the loyalist 
uh, governor and his uh, cabinet as being uh, rebellious against British laws. Here's some of the Sons of Liberty. Joseph Warren actually didn't, wasn't immediately a son of liberty. He seemed to have flirted with the other side for a while. And the governor, Thomas Hutchinson, whose um, mansion actually was along, what do you call it, the Prado, was burned down in a riot in 1765. So he wasn't a popular guy with the Sons of Liberty. He was one of Joseph Warren's patients as were a number of other loyalists. And Warren may have flirted with, uh, as they called it, the friends of government for a little while before he uh, was outraged by the occupation of Boston by British troops and the assertion of uh, British laws over colonial uh, American institutions. In, uh, now, with the uh, streets being occupied by soldiers, there was a running tension, in addition to these underlying political differences, with uh, the Sons of Liberty asserting American regional autonomy within the British Empire. There were also tensions between British soldiers patrolling the streets and regular citizens. The Sons of Liberty thought that there was no reason for soldiers to be here, that, uh, that uh, the Sons of Liberty were just pursuing uh, protests in a legal fashion. That's not the way the loyalists saw it. Uh, they saw it as something being uh, used to be present. So there was a demonstration outside of an importer by the name of Lilly who was def defying patriot boycotts against uh, imported British goods. One thing led to another and a customs inspector by the name of Malcolm ended up being besieged by a crowd of boy apprentices and uh, other miscellaneous sons of liberty um, throwing rocks and threatening the customs inspector. The customs inspector pointed a musket out of the window to try to scare them off, but unfortunately fired into the crowd and hit a young boy by the name of Christopher Sider was fatally shot. Joseph Warren uh, performed the autopsy on Chris Sider uh, and attended the boy, the boy in his final hours. Uh, it's really a rather touching interaction, which I detail in the book. Uh, I understand a future speaker, uh, a local historian, J.L. Bell, may be joining you in future months, who knows a lot about Christopher Sider. And you could just consider me teeing that discussion up. Uh, this happened actually just about 10 days prior to the Boston Massacre, which had some similar dynamics of demonstrating street level Sons of Liberty against the uh, representatives of the British administration. In this case, a platoon of soldiers patrolling the uh, old state house. Uh, one thing leads to another, and next thing are shooting the demonstrators. Joseph Warren uh, uh, wrote part of the official town of Boston account of the Boston Massacre that was shared with the other colonies and with uh, sympathizers called Whigs in Great Britain. Uh, commemora uh, annual commemorations of the Boston Massacre became a focal point for the Sons of Liberty to define uh, what their platform was, uh, both for themselves and for others. And these speeches in the revolutionary era actually crystallized a view of American liberty that existed more in an amorphous way prior to that. And Joseph Warren uh, had delivered these speeches twice in the years between 1770 and the last one in 1775. Uh, I quote some of these things at length. They, they have a very interesting view of America, some of which uh, are things we take for granted now, but were expressed either for the first time or in a very elegant time, even for those ideas that weren't original to Joseph Warren. Here he looks to the Ameri Native Americans as the only true owners of the land. 
uh, and uh, there really isn't anywhere in that thought for the king of England. <coughs> Taxation without representation. I won't spend a lot of time on the words. They uh, shortened that political expression considerably after Joseph Warren gave his speech. Pretty verbose thing. But, uh, he had a very forceful way of expressing not only the view of what defined American they had a way of speaking that spoke to individuals so that they felt what their responsibility was to advance the cause of American liberty. And that kind of um, personal charisma, but that ability to communicate in that way, was very characteristic of Joseph Warren in his speaking and in the content of what he was saying. John Adams who was a little bit on the junior side of the Son of Liberty at this time, looked up to Joseph Warren as a more effective speaker, as a crisper thinker, and a greater motivator of men and women. And that's our second president of the United States. That was his opinion of Joseph Warren. Joseph Warren was a key person in the Boston Tea Party. His exact role is not known, and uh, I identify in the book what that might well have been from the best surviving circumstantial evidence, but he stood on the podium during all the key Tea Party related meetings, the Old South Meeting House and Faneuil Hall, and he said virtually nothing during that time frame. But it's perfectly apparent that he was a key insider of the most radical ring, wing of the Boston Sons of Liberty, both immediately before and immediately after the Tea Party. Joseph Warren was the one who sent Paul Revere the day after the Tea Party with the news to patriots in New York and Philadelphia that it had occurred. So it begs the uh, question that, Joseph Warren was key in, uh, in the Tea Party. In fact, uh, the St. Andrew's Lodge of Masons is credited by many, including the St. Andrew's Lodge of Mason, as supplying the majority of the so-called Mohawk Indians who tossed the tea into the harbor. Joseph Warren's name does not exist on any list of Tea Party participants despite the fact that he may have run along the same paths. Okay, we, we have slowed down. Tea Party is just so dramatic. The computer is choked. following the Tea Party, the uh, Patriots probably hoped that the British would back down off of their more onerous uh, Tory ministerial policies, uh, including the, uh, the tea tax and that sort of thing. In fact, they had mostly backed down after the stamp tax riots in 1765, but it didn't play out that way at all. In fact, the British redoubled their efforts and closed down the port of Boston 
in punishment for the Tea Party. The news uh, actually came after some months, and Joseph Warren was among the leaders of the Sons of Liberty, as Massachusetts and Boston was on the point at that point of differences with England for all of North America in uh, providing focus to uh, resistance to the British at that point. Uh, in September of 1774, he drafted the Suffolk Resolves. At this point, he stepped out from the shadow of Samuel Adams. The First Continental Congress was meeting in Philadelphia. The delegates included Samuel Adams, John Adams, uh, later Robert Treat Payne, John Hancock. Those more familiar patriots go down to Philadelphia representing Massachusetts, which is on the point of uh, disputes with Great Britain, leaving Joseph Warren in charge. So these Suffolk resolves, and Suffolk County was no random county because it included Boston, whose port had been closed down and is a flashpoint of all differences with Great Britain. So the resolves coming out of Suffolk County were particularly important, extremely well and elegantly written, Paul Revere, again, assigned by Joseph Warren to ride them down to Philadelphia as soon as they passed, where they were presented to the Continental Congress, which was sort of floundering in its opening weeks. It galvanized the Continental Congress, who passed the Suffolk Resolves as resolution of the Continental Congress, word for word. Now, Joseph Warren um, is considered by some as a founder of the United States. And technically speaking, you have to have your name on the Declaration of Independence or, and or the Constitution of the United States to be considered a founder. Um, Joseph Warren uh, did not, and as you'll see, really he could not have had as things played out. But he uh, certainly was the author of the Suffolk Resolves, which is considered also a foundational document. The massacre oration, which he volunteered for in 1775, was particularly significant. Because unlike 1772, the British had reoccupied Boston. Not only that, but, uh, was, um, had closed the port in June of 1774. In the summer of 1774, they unilaterally voided the Massachusetts Charter with all its local autonomy. Uh, so things were uh, not coming to a peaceful resolution, which always was Joseph Warren's preference that American regional autonomy be left alone within the British Empire. But the British would have nothing to do with it. So the massacre oration had British soldiers present in 1775, and there were rampant rumors, well documented on both sides, that the British soldiers were going to arrest the leading patriots if anything were said against the king. In fact, there were rumors that they were going to assassinate the speaker. And those were not random street rumors. The former governor of Massachusetts, Thomas Hutchinson, who heard these rumors, and he was then in disgrace in Britain, but he had heard them and uh, they were amply recorded. So Samuel Adams, who was the chair of this meeting, decided that he would uh, not call off the meeting. And uh, apparently Joseph Warren had the option of not doing it, given the uh, risk of mayhem. So Joseph insisted that he would deliver the massacre oration. And in fact, did it with his typical flair. He shows up late, having seen six patients that morning in his office on Hanover Street, and he puts on a toga. He climbs through the window, because he couldn't come up the stairs, <laughs> um, because all these British soldiers are in the way, right? And uh, so why was he wearing the toga? In fact, this is the only major American speech I know of that was delivered in a toga. <laughs> well, for him, he was projecting Roman Republican virtues. And given he was actually delivering a kind of a multimedia, or what we would call multimedia, kind of presentation. 
citing the virtues of the past, Roman Republican virtues, as aspirational for the Sons of Liberty, the virtues of the Pilgrims and North American founders, into the responsibilities of citizens in the present to define and maintain liberty and constitutional government. They're talking about British Constitution at this point. And also how the future would judge individuals and the effort. Where is he getting this talk? Old South Meeting House. Old South Meeting House. The British soldiers were, th were threatening him. One of the soldiers held up a handful of musket balls. He was just rubbing them around as if, as if to say, you're going to get shot or we're going to do something, right? So Joseph Warren pulls out his handkerchief and just drops it on the guy's hand and continues his speech. That's Joseph Warren. As a, uh, as a college student, he, uh, he put on the patriotic play called Cato, which was then very popular. It was a play by Addison. It was written by, in 1712. And he had it performed several times in his dorm room, as his classmates noted. Probably its most famous line at the time, and I paraphrase, is that Cato, who was who opposed Julius Caesar's tyranny. In the face of Julius Caesar's victory, this is a historical play, right? In the face of Julius Caesar's victory in the Civil War, Cato, the head of the Republican uh, senators, committed suicide rather than submit to Julius Caesar. And it was said, and I paraphrase, I regret, but I have but one life give for my country. <coughs> that play was also a favorite of George Washington, who had it performed at Valley Forge, and elsewhere, and a uh, obscure Yale, Yale by the name of Nathan Cab. Powerful words. I won't read them all. One of the things I did in the book is, since we have a personage who's not well known, uh, I quote his speeches and letters at great length, and I, I provide, you know, interpretation of them, but you could read and enjoy them yourself. I mean, some of these words leap off the page. The tools of power in every age rack their inventions to justify the few in sporting with the happiness of the many, having found their sophistry too weak to hold mankind in bondage and then piously dared to force religion, the daughter of the king of heaven, to become a prostitute in the service of hell. <laughs> they taught princes, honored with the name of Christians, might bid defiance to the founder of their faith, might pillage pagan countries, and deluge them with blood, only because they boasted themselves to be the disciples of that teacher who strictly charged his followers to do unto others as they would do unto them. He wasn't a big fan of colonialism. He saw America as above this. Even in the face of occupation by the British Army, closure of the port of Boston by the most powerful navy in the world, he was not to be deterred by, their, by threats of assassination or about the American cause in general. When you depend the fortunes of America, you are to decide the important questions on which rest the happiness and liberty of millions yet unborn. Act worthy of yourselves. This was inspirational to the people who heard it. it was, the speech was published many times in pamphlet form, distributed all up and down the United States, and overseas too. Some modern politicians were, uh, continue to be inspired by this, we know about it. Ronald Reagan included that 
in his memorable 1981 inaugural speech verbatim, with full attribution to Joseph Warren. Mm -hmm. However, you, can, you don't have to be of one party or the other, because Joseph Warren predated all current political parties, but he did have a view of what America could be and should be. Now, this account book gets pretty interesting on the eve of the Revolutionary War. This is the page that includes April the 19th, 1775. Now let me tell you what happened in Warren's office on Hanover Street on the evening of April 19, 1775, which isn't recorded here, but it's recorded by Paul Revere. Joseph War Warren called in Paul Revere urgently at 10 p.m. on April the 18th and told Paul Revere to warn the patriots west of Boston out to Concord that the British were coming to seize the, uh, the Provincial Congress's warlike stores in Concord. He knew exactly, Warren knew exactly what the British were up to. He assigned Paul Revere on the right. Paul Revere notes that a half an hour before Revere got there, at 9.30, Joseph Warren had called in William Dawes with the same request. And they also had set up lanterns, a lantern signal at that church that's around here, to make sure if those riders couldn't get out of British-occupied Boston, that there would be a visual <laughs> signal to the patriots at Charlestown who knew to look for it. Where did Joseph Warren, how did he find that out? It is a recurrent mystery of history. So how did Joseph Warren have such <coughs> uncanny, accurate intelligence? It's not known exactly. And in the book, I describe the different ways that that might have happened. But there are some very strangely named patients in this account book in the months prior to the Revolutionary War. Now, are there any accountants in the room? There, are, there is. You know, an account book. It's not too different than a modern version of, of QuickBooks or something. So accounts are set up with the intention of collecting at some future time. So you identify the accounts, when these services were delivered, how much money, and that kind of thing. There's a, a, not a whole lot of money circulating in a colonial type of place like Massachusetts, so there's a lot of bartering going on with very long-term accounts, you know, anticipating collection at a later time. So why would you have someone just called the Indian? Like, how are you supposed to collect on that account? Who the heck is the Indian? Now, the Indian shows up along with the son of the most radical printer in Boston, Eads and Gills, Boston Gazette. You have, I think, now a uh, reconstructed office of Eads and Gills near, near the church. They were the most radical of Sons of Liberty newspapers. So the Indian shows up in tandem to Joseph Warren dozens of times prior to the Revolutionary War with this printer's son, who later the British jail as a uh, suspected uh, spy <laughs> during the siege of Boston, John Gill. So is this a real Native American, or is this like a Mohawk Indian? to kind of throw tea into the harbor? I don't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> Who's the poor Negro woman? Who's the woman in Damnation Alley? Mr. Catter. Now, there's a more standard name, but that is really suspicious. Joseph Warren pays out to Mr. Catter bags of half-pence coins. Bags of them. 20 shillings worth of half-pence coins. Many coin collectors know how big a half penny was in those. That is one bag of coins. Why would he do that? There's nothing like that in all of his accounts. Now, we know British officers were complaining that the off-duty sailors could get drunk on cheap North End rum for a half pence a shot. 
Was this guy buying intelligence from the sleazier bars and reporting Joe's form? We don't know. But I tell you, there's some weird people there. Who is camp woman? Camp woman is a slang term for women associated with an army. There's only one army in Boston at the time. It wasn't the Americans. Margaret Temple Gage is the wife of the British general. Persistent rumors <laughs> are just that, are that she was the source of Joseph Warren's intelligence. I deal with this in the book. Ultimately, I don't believe it, but I cite all the sources. Um, uh, a popular and award-winning uh, author, David Hackett Fisher, who wrote Paul Revere's Ride about 15 or 20 years ago, actually does believe that Margaret Kemble Gage may have been the snitch. So she's the wife of the ranking British general, right? And the thought is that she was the source? But who was Campbell? Now, and the case, of course, is circumstantial. Uh, Joseph Warren um, was a widower at the time. He, in turn, had four kids at that point. His wife died, apparently, in childbirth in 1773. It was sad it wasn't all that unusual. So Margaret Campbell Gage, you know, she said she's a lot older than her husband. She has friends on both sides. Was she the source of the intelligence? There are some people, including folks in the Society of the Cincinnati, hereditary organization of revolutionary work uh, officers who assert that there was a personal relationship between Warren and Gage. Read the book. <laughs> At any rate, Warren knew what, where to send Paul Revere. So anyway, just, just to make a note though, Paul Revere is famous around here, right? Warren is the boss. He's the president of the Provincial Congress. He's the head of the Committee of Safety. He's the one who decides that there should be a Lexington and Concord alarm and sends Paul Revere on the mission. And William Dawes. He's the man. This interaction occurred in his medical office on Hanover Street in the North End. Is that an iconic event in American history, or what? Is this noted anywhere, plaque, statue, where his office was? Nada. Nothing. What's there now? Uh, best I can tell, it's buried under the North Plaza of Government Center. Okay, so Joseph Warren not only sends the riders out, triggers the alarm, he escapes from Boston sometime during the night, and joins the fighting himself in the afternoon in Menominee. Not only that, he's tending the wounded and fighting, which anybody who's ever been a hospital foreman or a doctor or a nurse in the military know is a pretty unusual combination. Not a, not a problem for Joe's point. He's, uh, he's next to a Colonel Heath. He gets an earlock of his hair shot off by a musket ball. Well documented. Just shrugs his shoulder. Yeah, no problem. He, uh, during the Siege of Boston, so the British get chased back into Boston, and the Siege of Boston begins. He is the ranking person during the Siege of Boston. President of the Provincial Congress, the chair of the Committee of Safety, the militia generals answered to him. And meanwhile, they have no official you know, existence. They're waiting for the Continental Congress to bless them as a Continental Army, but they haven't done it yet. So while they're laying siege to the most powerful army and navy in the world, they don't have enough gunpowder. Don't have money to buy anything. But chains of command are murky from the militias coming in from New Hampshire, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts. They're facing down this army. Maybe. Does Joseph Warren give up? No. He does one of the most impressive situational leadership 
performances, I think, in American history. Here's just some of the things that he did in the weeks after Lexington and Concord. Waters collection of the affidavits so that the account of what happened during the Battle of Lexington and Concord is the American Patriots account. He makes sure he hires a ship under the Provincial Congress umbrella to go to England with the Patriots account. He's not waiting for orders to come to Philadelphia. He just does it. So that the Patriots account of what happened in Lexington and Concord got to England and London three weeks prior to General Gage's account. And they were hoping that sympathizers over there would even at that late date reverse the British policies, but they didn't. Uh, he, he negotiated uh, transit of refugees, Tories who wanted to go into occupied Boston, Patriots who wanted to come out. Um, he teed up the quest for the cannons of Ticonderoga, which, you, as you know, was what eventually broke the siege of Boston. It is attributed entirely to George Washington and General Knox. In fact, the capture of the cannons was Benedict Arnold of all people coming up from Connecticut with this crazy idea of sending a group of troops up to Ticonderoga to seize the cannon there before the British could react. Unbeknownst to them, Ethan Allen was on the same tack. So Joseph Warren, again, just said, hey, great idea, fine. We'll appoint you a colonel in the Massachusetts militia, give you 100 pounds, gunpowder, bayonets, go up there and do it. And sure enough, he goes up there, Benedict Arnold meets up with Ethan Allen, and they get the cannons of Ticonderoga. Bringing them back, well, that was a different story. The Warren champion back. So he was thinking as to why that was important. He was thinking strategically, on a grand scale. His appeals to the Continental Congress, get your act together and form the Continental Army, will you? Please? So, by June of 1775, two, two months after the election of Trump, the situation starts to change. British, they're not relenting. They're sending in reinforcements, shiploads of new soldiers, cavalry, generals, Burgoyne and Howe, Clinton, to get Thomas Gage off his duff and go chase these Americans, right? Um, so Joseph Warren uh, was going to be offered being the head physician, the first Surgeon General of the Army. At this point, appointments in the provincial militia are likely stepping stones to the widely anticipated Continental Army. So Joseph Warren always wanted to be where the need was the greatest. Perceived at that point that the, the contest was going to be decided militarily. So that rather than being the Surgeon General, he lobbied to be a fighting Major General. And his charisma was such that, you know, his, his friends and, and, and uh, people that he worked with in the Provincial Congress and the Committee of Safety and that kind of thing, they included some uh, experienced officers from the French and Indian War. You know, they didn't say, you're nuts, Warren, you know, be a doctor. They said, uh, if you want to be a fighting Major General, we think you could do it. So they picked him to be a fighting Major General on June the 14th, 1775. The full Congress had to uh, confirm the Major Generalship. Things were happening so fast at that point, uh, rumors were coming out, credible rumors, coming out of Boston that the British intended to fortify Dorchester Heights. So the Committee of Safety gets together with the militia generals with Warren. They say, what are we going to do about this? Let's preempt their move and fortify Bunker Hill. Uh, they go out to Bunker Hill, 1,000 Americans, 1,200 Americans. Confused situation, they end up fortifying Breed's Hill, which is closer to Boston, and people don't even know how that happened to this day. So Joseph Warren goes out to the battlefield on June the 17th, 1775, in the afternoon. And the first person he runs into is Israel Putnam, his militia general, who's the ranking general on the field. He's standing on Bunker Hill, half mile back, Braids Hill, 
trying to direct things as best he can, but the militias, you know, half take orders from anybody anyway at that point. So um, Israel Putnam says, hey, I heard, Warren, I heard that you were just appointed Major General. Glad to see you here. The command is yours. What are my orders? So Warren says, uh, my commission hasn't been confirmed yet. In America, elected government will always be superior over the military. Therefore, if my commission has not been confirmed, I am not but here as a major general, but as a soldier to learn. Tell me where the fighting is going to be the hottest. Israel Putnam, who was a very colorful fellow, so I suspect the words got cleaned up in these accounts, basically said, are you crazy? You know, like, out of here. But he said, if you insist, you know, go up to that dirt fort a half mile ahead. That's what it's going to do. And sure enough, he gets up there, and uh, the, the people in the dirt fort of Bunker Hill, you know, had been working all night to build this fort and were not relieved, and they had no water and they had no food. They thought they were betrayed because as the sun came up and these British warships were out there blasting broadsides at them. They saw just how exposed that they were. They thought they had been betrayed. But when Joseph Warren showed up, the head of the Provincial Congress, they let out a cheer. Warren's here. He'll be right with us. Same conversation, Prescott and Warren. Prescott says, I heard you're a major general. Glad to see you here. The command is yours. One of my orders. No, I'm a common soldier, blah, blah, blah. Okay, fine. Go fight it. British charge three times. On the third charge, the Americans run out of ammunition. Some of that gunpowder Joseph Warren sent up to Ticonderoga to capture uh, the uh, fort up there with Benedict Arnold would have come in handy just then. The Americans ran out of ammunition. People on both sides just talk about the guns just sputtering out. British saw what happened, fixed their bayonets, charged from both sides. Americans had to retreat. Uh, during the retreat, sometime during the retreat, in a confused situation, Joseph Warren was killed. The original title of this picture, which you see in every textbook that talks about Bunker Hill and is at the New Boston Museum of Fine Arts, painted by John Trumbull, who was a witness to the battle, is the death of Major General Joseph Warren at the Battle of Bunker's Hill, June 17, 1775. They don't name pictures like that much anymore. He's the one in the white. He's the centerpiece of the Joseph Warren did not leave the earth in an uncomplicated way. He was betrothed to be married, Miss Mercy Scully, unknown, he's unknown currently, daughter of liberty. Scully Square, have you ever heard of that? Yeah. That's the family. Miss Mercy Scully, very impressive individual. I have some of her writings in my book. I think it's the most extensive de uh, description of Mercy Scully ever in print. Uh, this magnificent picture uh, by John Singleton Copley is simply known as the lady in the blue dress. The uh, identity of the sitter has been unknown for 250 years, and I demonstrate in the book that that is indeed Mercy Scully. She uh, tried to adopt the children, the four children of Warren, uh, after his death, uh, ended up uh, fighting the family over that because she was never formally married and lost to the family and never married and died 50 years later. Uh, there's a bizarre story about uh, Joseph Warren's head being on display. I have that in the appendix. The, the relevance of it, besides odd tales, is that a picture of Joseph Warren's skull, actually taken by one of his descendants, 
allow a forensic reconstruction of the uh, fatal wound of Joseph Warren. That hole does not belong there. Does not. Does not belong there. It's a musket hole right through the head. Now, there is a, there are about 12 widely conflicting accounts of the last moments of Joseph Warren at the Battle of Bunker Hill. In fact, it was a, a heroic conceit for the first two generations of America. Joseph Warren is the hero of the Battle of Bunker Hill. He was nationally famous. There are counties and cities all over the United States named after Joseph Warren. Yes? Oh, okay. So at any rate, I do some fancy forensics to tell which of the 12 stories are true. That's the one I have in the book. Uh, the Warren, the tie-in to the Warren family, the two-year-old who found the father with the broken neck, John Warren, became a doctor himself, founded Harvard Medical School. Uh, a nephew, uh, founder of Mass General Hospital, Ether Dome, first uh, use of anesthesia. He's the weird guy who had a picture of Warren's head. Uh, statue to Warren, North End, no, Roxbury, 1904, a 12-foot, 4,000-pound statue of Warren made from 20 Civil War cannon, 12-foot tall, taken down as too big and unwieldy for the area in around 1968 and put into a Boston Parks and Recreation <coughs> boneyard where it was noticed by folks from the Boston Latin School who under questionable circumstances took that statue where it stands now. The picture on the right is the statue owned by the city of Boston on the private campus of Boston Latin School. On a simple piece of cement unmarked as to what it is, not publicly available. There are some uh, <coughs> discussions afoot of relocating the statue to some more appropriate place in Boston or the North End, close to the Freedom Trail. Uh, nothing has been done with that yet, although I find myself on point for it. Boston being what it, the kind of town that it is, the fact that a Brookline person is interested is one thing, but city of Boston voters are something else. So if you have any interest in keeping track of what happens to the statue, or have some thoughts of where it should be relocated, uh, please, uh, I have a, a book. You can sign your name, email, phone. I'll keep you posted on what happens with this effort. The uh, Boston Arts Commission owns decisions on where these statues should be. Obviously, Boston Latin has become fond of the statue that they have acquired, so to speak. Roxbury Latin. Roxbury Latin. Excuse me. Yes, yes. Not Boston Latin, which is down down Latin. This is Roxbury Latin Academy, where Joseph Warren was a, an alum. Sure. Um, but uh, yeah, so there, you know, obviously it's in the city of Boston, so if there's interest in going somewhere else, we have to have some Boston uh, citizens. Um, talk a lot about Warren. We'll leave him with the last word. Thank you very much. Uh, those of you who would want a copy of the book yourself, uh, I have them sign them for you for $29.99. Uh, you could also buy them on Amazon. And uh, even if you don't buy the book, I hope you uh, recognize, learn a little bit about an extraordinary North End resident and uh, carry on his legacy. Thank you.